Hi everyone. Um, we'll get started. Um, I the way that we'll do this is we'll have Penny talk, and uh, when he's when he's finished, uh, we'll have the two microphones set up on the side, and you can walk up and ask a question. Um, so. Uh, it's an honor to introduce my friend, Hany Almadun, the Director of Philanthropy at Narwa USA. Um, Hany is the child of an educator. He was raised with the mantra of school being his top priority, and he eventually found his way to the United States, thanks to a university scholarship from the LDS Church. We met in 2002 in our Book of Mormon class for non-LDS students. Um, hearing him speak in class led me to realize I was definitely not as smart as I once thought I was. Um, he has a professional and personal connection to the question of refugees in Gaza, and he will share his experiences with crisis management, fundraising, and being a human. So please help me welcome him. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Henry Madhum, Director of Philanthropy at Onorwa USA. I came from Washington, D.C. this morning because I've been trying to come here since November, but uh, a lot is happening, as you've seen. We've been uh, super busy. I happen to be from Gaza. My family is in North Gaza, so that's where you hear about the famine and the starvation and all that. It's all too real. And the worst part is you work for the largest humanitarian actor that delivers food, and you're not able to get food to your own family. So that uh, that's makes it a lot more painful than it is. You raise millions of dollars, and you help people that are not your family. And you know, I just want to share a few of those experiences, and I'd love to give you an opportunity for questions and answers. This is a dialogue and a conversation. I think you know, I'm a, I'm a human being. I have family in the war. I've lost family members. I, you know, so I'll tell you more about that. So, Pulau Wa USA is uh, an American charity that's about 20 years old. It is separate than UNRWA. UNRWA is the agency that does the work in Gaza and the West Bank and. East Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and Syria. Everything we do is to benefit UNRWA. We do two things, basically the fundraising part in the US for tax reasons. You know, if you give to a UN agency, uh, it's not tax exempt. If you give to a national committee like uh, World Food Program, USA, things like that, you get the tax benefits. So I work for the, the US, UNRWA USA. So, and we do awareness. So in addition to fundraising, the awareness building, what does that mean? Is an agency asking you to do something or to talk to your members of Congress? Doesn't fly, but if an American charity that you have a conviction with tells you, hey, maybe call your member of Congress, tell them to fund or refund or something like that, people will respond. I, we raise funds from individuals and institution of donors, my specialty and some corporations. I work with the individuals. My colleague Jason does a great job with the institutional side. And you know, they say people give to people. So, you know, even foundations and institutions and even states, you know, have these relationships. So a good year for owner of USA in fundraising, we would be fortunate enough to raise seven million a year. We think this is a great year. And in two months you know, since October of last year, we've raised twenty million dollars. So Last year's financial performance is equivalent to the last eight years of fundraising. So that tells you about how invested American donors are in this. This is, it's one thing to go show up to a rally for free and support. I've done that myself, but also another to write a check. And that's one conversation I always have with elected officials. You know, I've said I'm professional, but also I have a family in Gaza, so I talk to members of the government and the media on that capacity as well. And oftentimes I tell them, you know, I show them a map and say, here's where our donors. And it checks with whatever party they affiliate with and say, these people in California, 9,000 people gave, in, in New York, 8,000, in Texas, in Chicago. And then it becomes real because they think it's just a bunch of hungry college kids. So speaking of college kids, you know, I have some good meetings today, so thank you guys for hosting me. Especially Rima, she just came from Syria. Another place where one operates. So just to keep that in mind, you know, in addition to that financials, you know, we've had to deal with a lot of things. You know, October 7th happened, 
we as an organization, obviously we're a young team. I do not need to join the parade to say those are horrible circumstances, crimes, horrible attacks against Israelis. You know, everybody knows we're, we're an established that. So our team gets together and, and says, okay, so we're gonna have a crisis, what do we do? Uh, fortunately for our team, we had developed an emergency fundraising uh, protocol based on the Syria and Turkey earthquake, because we find in emergencies there is a million direction folks go, and you know some of those is like, hey, basic things, update the website, the landing page should talk about Gaza, or the landing page should talk about the crisis. We might be raising money in emails and text messaging, and it's all about getting the messaging right. I and mean, we would never, UNO or USA would never raise funds for a cause that we do not, we are not engaged in meaning of UNRWA, is not in Turkey, we would never say, hey, UNRWA is not is, is in, in, in Turkey. So we limit our response where we can actually make a difference. Uh, there's, too many, there's too many great organizations that do good work. Just a quick distinction, some people may have this question, is UNRWA versus UNHCR. So for all refugees under the sun, UNHCR works with them. That's the other UN agency that supports refugees. UNRWA, in fact, older than UNHCR, and it was it's even UNRWA was older than the International Convention on Refugees. UNRWA was started in 1949. A few months later, UNHCR was started. And UNRWA only works with Palestine refugees. We don't say Palestinian refugees, Palestine is a place. So this is technically, you could have Armenians who live in Palestine, and they could benefit from UNRWA services if they qualify. So that's sort of the thinking. We say Palestine refugees, it sounds, doesn't add up, or somebody doesn't speak English, they don't say Palestinian refugees because it's not nationality. And I'll answer any questions about that distinction. Great organization. Right now, for the first 90 days of the, I call it genocide, I, you know, if you have issues with that, please let me know. Uh, UNRWA, the, the UN agencies and the Red Cross were the two entities that are able to bring in uh, relief into Gaza. And the UN umbrella includes the World Food Program, the uh, World Health Organization, UNICEF, and also a small outfit that does a lot of good work for women health is called UNFPA, I think United Population Fund. I was surprised how committed from their communication they are to doing work in Gaza. All these actors in the UN lead on UNRWA. UNRWA is the largest actor. What does that mean? UNRWA has 13,000 staff in Gaza. 13,000 staff. They have all the cars and fleets for the UN. They have the warehouses. So the World Food Program brings a plane worth of food. They don't have the logistics. UNRWA is the supporter for all of those entities. They bring it through the warehouses. One other thing about UNRWA, it is usually, and the UN Secretary General said this recently, UNRWA's cost is one third of what other UN agencies would pay. That means if UNRWA brings a food truck and the World Food Program brings a food truck, UNRWA's cost will be a third of what the other agencies pay. And that's a unique distinction to UNRWA because 99.9% .9 of the staff are local Palestinian refugees. That means other agencies hire expats and what have you. UNRWA hires from the local staff. It's in the name UNRWA is a relief and works agency. So that ends up with a lot of you know, people live there, they're not having to put their kids in international schools and all that. So that's why UNRWA was able to perform those jobs. And we started telling the story. We're telling folks, hey, you know, UNRWA was the, sh the shelter place. As we speak, there's 1.5 5 million, 1 1.5 changes on the day and wherever Israel is bombing, people move around. 1.5 million refugees sheltering inside 154 UNRWA built installations. So this installation could be a vocational training center, it could be a school, it could be a clinic, and that's a lot, you know. In one case, there is a school in Magazi. It was outfitted to accommodate 4,000 people. Right now, it's housing 36,000 people. That means you end up with situations <coughs> with 500 people to use a toilet, one toilet. Maybe 700 people for a shower. The local sewage networks in those areas do not support that kind of massive growth. You got Rafah, which is the smallest 
the governor governor for an area in Gaza, the small district in Gaza. It had 200,000 people. Within a week, it had 1.2 million people. So all that people went south. You hear now they want to attack Rafah. We'll talk about that if it comes up. So that's sort of the, the scale of UNRWA's level. We, UNR was aiming to get to 500 trucks a day, but really in the past few weeks, maybe the past two weeks, the Israelis have slowed down the aid. So in January, we got to 100, 150 trucks a day. Now the Israelis are only allowing like 35, 30, 20, even maybe zero trucks a day. And despite the US's pressuring them to bring in humanitarian aid, they're not really pressuring them hard enough. They keep mentioning it, but you know, that creates a problem. So the Israeli is now telling the Americans, hey, we want to bring in aid, but these Israeli protesters are blocking access to the road. So it's a hack. They came up with this thing where they, yes, we want to help, we want to get food, but they're slowing down the aid. And you understand they're telling the, now in the negotiation that they may drive up the aid to 500 trucks a day if they release some of those hostages, and they hope every one of them gets released. But at the end of the day, I really have to be true about myself and the struggle of my own family in this. So I, you know, if I choke, let me. So in a, about a week before Thanksgiving last year, my nephew, Hanny, named after me, was walking to a house nearby to get a gas tank because they ran out and they think in the old house they had one. An Israeli sniper shoot him in the head. And this is a 17-year-old boy just walking about his life. And then a Samaritan, a good Samaritan, sees him, really risks his own life, pulls him, an ambulance takes him to where? The Baptist Hospital, Mustashfil Ma'amadani, which you know that's already been bombed. So they would not admit him because it's at capacity, and they just really let him wait in the parking lot that was bombed. And somebody tells my brother, Muhammad, so Muhammad, here is his son, his firstborn, he goes, and the Israelis have not gotten into the north yet. The tanks were coming, drawing in. So he finds a path. He goes to the hospital, tries to beg him to see him. They said, no, we're at capacity. We don't have the beds. He hires a, a Palestinian driver. He pays him basically his liver to get him to move during this time. And they get him to the Indonesian hospital. Remember, this guy shot in the head. We're not talking about like a little uh, you know, cut here or a bruise. And then the Indonesian hospital, the doctors operate on him under the flashlight with a battery-powered drill and operate, and they find that the bullet did not really get in his brain, and they are saving his life. So alhamdulillah, he's alive and good to go. About two days later, my sister Fatin was at her home. The Israelis bombed next door, and then the shards opened her head. Oh, about, uh, I heard about 20 stitches. So she goes, the family goes to check up on her. They take care of her. That was, a, that was on Thursday. It was Thanksgiving or the day before Thanksgiving. So they go to the hospital, the Kamal Edwan Hospital, which another story you would know, that's where they've had the men leave unclothed and where they shot the grandmother as she held her child. And, and then the family leaves our shelter, the shelter they were that's my brother's house in Mashur, Betlahia, the Betlahia project. They leave the house to go to check on my older sister because she was hurting. Everybody leaves the shelter except my brother Majid and his family. Then it gets too late. These kids, they cannot go at night. They hear the rap Israeli snipers. They say, hey, let's stay put and sleep on the hospital floor. And the next morning we go back to wherever we were sheltering. So that's uh, Thanksgiving night. Then at 5.15 on a Friday morning, that's Black Friday, 5.15, uh, at 7 a.m. they were supposed to have the first truce. If you remember that, the first truce was supposed to take effect at 7 a.m. 5.15, the Israeli army destroys the house where all my family was sheltering, killing my brother Majid and his wife Safa, his girls Riman, his girl Siwar, and Omar and Ali, total six people, one bomb, American bombs. He's a full-time civilian. He was praying Fajr for all we know, 515 is that the first Muslim prayer. And his daughters had the, the hijab, they were ready to pray. And they were killed, 
their bodies were recovered in the duration of a week because the damage was so great and there is no machinery to come to move. So brave family members of mine dug up the building to get the bodies. The first body was recovered is, uh, is uh, Omar. His body flew to the neighbor's house. This history is a soccer player. And it's just impressive that a little boy like that, nine years old. We were with him a few months earlier. In fact, we got him a soccer ball from, I think it was had the Mexican flag, because I figured it looks like the Palestinian color flag. So he was so excited about it. And then the next body we dug was my brother, Matthew. It was intact, but trauma to the head. And I just want to remind you, my mom just lost her son, and I called her, and she was guarding the rubble where the house used to stand. So they've survived this because they weren't there. They've been sheltering there for the last 50 days. So my brother is dead, but she also wanted to guard his body because stray dogs have been munching the people. This is a true story. A grieving mom sitting there helpless, nobody. They offered like 10 times the price for a machinery or an excavator to come to get them. They couldn't get them. So imagine you have to dig the body if you're a child and protecting it from the stray dogs. And they kept digging. My sister-in-law, Safa, had lost all her family the day before, a, a week before. So she grieved them and then she joined them. Her body was buried twice because they first kept one half from the digging, then the next day they put the rest. That's the sort of the graphic details they've dealt with. In fact, we adopted a cat when we were in Gaza for the summer. We named her Lucky. My brother imagined me, so rest in peace, would not call her Lucky, he would call her Cece. I don't know why. But she also died with them. And she was, her body was found between the, between Riman and, and Omar and Ali. So when they tell you this news, you like it, thank you already. And I don't really know if my heart heard the news or my heart because it was racing before I even heard the news, so I'm not sure what went. And you know, I was with him this summer. We, we had a great time. He's, so he's, I'm like 42, he's 41, so we're always, you know, just hanging out. You know, just doing the sibling stuff. And I, my, my mom reminded me that all of the blue I will just, they will find me hanging out with him. They don't, like I've never given much time. So she reflects back and say, maybe, you know, God has a plan for you to see your brother and say goodbye to him. August 1st, he called me and said, we're at the beach. I go and take pictures of them, like a photo shoot for my family relatives. And it's the last thing that people will see, you know, because a few months later, like I'm the only one who have those pictures. I don't know why he called his them at the beach. And I said, I'm going to go. And I went. So a week before this happened, his sister, his daughter, before October 7th happened, his daughter, Salam, gets engaged, and she's literally like 18 years old. And, it, and I, in my heart, I was telling my, myself, it's too soon, too early, like, why are you, you know? I don't know why, I was looking like I was, I wish they had waited. But then, because she was engaged to be married, she moved to Rafah to shelter with her husband, and she survived. So he has his daughter, Salam, Arah, they're both to Rafah now, and we're taking care of them. We think we've seen the end of it. We grieve. I've had my crisis of faith. I assure you, I, I, it, it, it messes you up. You could be in the road, the highway, driving to DC to the office, and you just cry. It's a sleep. Then, about uh, sometimes in December, I think December 15th, the Israelis publish a video of uh, unclothed Palestinian men. They're saying they're According to my Israeli friend, who's a lovely professor in North Carolina, he said in the Israeli side, they say they're Hamas. And then, oops, I see my younger brother, Mahmoud. He is in the back of the line. I was like, this is my brother. I know him 100%. And my, my nephew, Abdullah Abud, from his haircut. And then we just run with the story. And PR gets on it because Israeli claims say the Hamas, I know the majority of these guys, and they're not the brightest uh, tool in the box or the sharpest tool, they're, they're good guys, but they're not any threat to anybody. 
So they, they've published this picture, they've taken them to unknown places. NBC wrote about it, BBC, I emailed my contact at the National Security Council, and, and they, within 20 hours, my brother was released. Because he's, he's a civilian, they just want to have pictures of humiliated Palestinians and tell people they have a success, they're, they're arresting Hamas people. It was nice if it's true, but these are just civilian people sitting there with the kids, you know, they're sitting there with their kids. So, you know, they released him. Then a few days later, my 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 Benchali, my uncle, my my cousin, maternal cousin, he's standing in line for the food line at an Unrwa facility to receive food assistance. And a fight breaks out. People are desperate. He gets shot in the foot. Two weeks later, he's six feet under. No medical care. He's just shot in the foot, you could survive it. There is no hospitals, you know. People with even mundane things, they die. This guy also, we hang out at the end of the summer. Then about two weeks after, his brother, uh, who takes videos and pictures and goes around and has really, he has, he has dogs, which is unique in Gaza. You have cats, but dogs is like a rebellious. So he's, he's the guy who like, he owns playing with dogs. He got shot by a drone as he was going there, him and his, uh, his uh, nephew. And I was like, crap, these are my people. I know these people. And none of them is militant. None of them have anything to do with anything. In fact, the two cousins I mentioned last, they're one of the Abbas's biggest advocates and supporters. Doesn't matter. They're, they're killing people left or right. And then most of the recent ones is my uncle, my, my child. My maternal uncle, he's my mom's brother. He died from kidney failure because the hospital is all blown up to pieces and he could not get his dialysis. And his last day he was not seeing and people know he's, he's dying. And that's, you know, this is the family. If you look at our last name in Gaza, about 130 people have been killed. I know some of those people. The majority of them are women and children. Now, I have to grieve, but I also do my job. And if you remember, if you remember, UNRWA is the largest humanitarian actor. We're leading the fundraising, we're telling the stories of folks, but also we are bound by the neutrality agreement. We cannot take sides, we cannot you know, call out, we can say five Palestinians killed, but we're not in the business to say who killed them. So that's sort of like the, the struggle, because the UN principle is you have to be neutral. You just watch a video and you observe. You don't make any judgments. So that's hard. What also made it harder is we're in the social media stage, where some influencer releases a video and says, oh, Unruh was leaving the north, and they're going to the south. They're abandoning the people. And then I get 50 emails from angry supporters and allies who love the Palestinians are good things somehow and we're, we're selling them or we're compromising them. And then that happened. In crisis, rumors are just really insane. We respond to that and people appreciate the response. Then about two weeks later, you've seen the warehouse, the folks raided the warehouse, you know, early on. So people say, the owner has food, why are you not giving it to people? But they forget that there is no fuel and there is no communication for a few days. How is owner going to dispatch things from one place to another? So folks took these food, took these items, I hope the starved people took it. But what happened that created another problem. So people grabbed three bags of flour, they only need one, but they're going to deal with the two. They're going to sell it. And they have one was low. And then all of a sudden, why is one was selling the food? In the history of 75 years, UNRWA has not ever had a cash collection mechanism. They've never collected a dollar. UNRWA is the obligation of the international community for their Dembian refugees and tell us a just solution for their, for their plight. So a lot of those are happening. People in Houston wanted me to go to, do, to talk at their fundraisers. I go. In Atlanta, you know, so there is a lot of those things, and I cannot find it in my heart to take a day off because I see the Palestinian doctors have been working around the clock 144 days, and I feel ashamed like I'm safe, nobody's bombing me here. 
Yes, I'm getting hate mail. I'm getting messages from anonymous sources, my colleague got a death threat. So there is that pressure. And at the end, we forget our humanity. You know, we're like, wait, like, and, and sometimes your allies turn on you. One of the saddest things is, where, remember that video of the expired food? Everybody talked about the expired food, the cookies. So somebody put a video of expired cookies were given out to Gaza by the World Food Program. But they were not expired. What was the issue is, remember, in America, they do the day differently than everybody else. They do month, day, and a year. In Europe and the Middle East, these are daily, month, year. So the cookies had two months on them or something like that, and people just were really yelling and asking for a refund. And I'm like, and I just tell them, like, guys, calm down. I'm not some foreign agent. My family is being run. Relax. And we have these conversations, and most of the time, it's, it's good. People, OK, calm down. But at the end of the day, we're facing a lot of rumors and misinformation from our allies. Fast forward to you know, the recent allegations against UNRWA, and then I wake up the next day, and then people are also angry for the rumors. You know, like, ah, oh, you're Hamas, you're all that stuff. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like, these are obviously they're serious allegations. Somebody's dealing with them. And UNRWA just actually, I, I advise you all to go check it out. They just released a statement today about fact versus fiction. Very powerful statement that sorts out all these allegations against UNRWA. So basically, everybody who works at UNRWA, their name is given to Israel for clearance. Nobody ever works for UNRWA before they're shared with Israel. UNRWA shares the names of the staff, the storage unit, the cars, all that. In fact, the coordinates of UNRWA are shared with the IDF twice a day. And guess what? They still get bought. More than 300 UNRWA facilities have been bombed, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. More than 400 Palestinians sheltering inside UN facilities have been killed, and 1,500 maybe been injured. And obviously, we, all, we cannot help but notice the timing of those allegations. UNRWA was taking these allegations seriously to the extreme where they actually fired the staff that are allegedly did what Israel did. A lot of Palestinians are upset about that. But when I was said, yes, we don't have any evidence, but we fired them to change the story or take that political football away. If they are cleared, they will receive compensation. Additional things. The Israeli, the Israeli authorities have never shared any evidence with one until now. They just went to the media and told this story. So there is two independent investigations that are happening right now within one in UNRWA and one outside UNRWA with the highest investigation authority within the UN looking into this. So all of a sudden, we're also now getting attacked for different things. And UNRWA is the agency that's bringing literally saving lives, medicine, and food. It's the biggest actor inside Gaza. There is no replacement. There is no replacement for the agency, for the scope, the size, and somehow, I honestly cannot do my work as much because everybody is just misinformed. There is rumors, allegations. Now, the silver lining about this is a lot of people rallied around. We have a lot of people who stepped up. Yes, I did get 20 emails asking me for a refund, but we gave it a day, and none of those folks wanted it. Like, they just, you know, they got out of their system. And you know, if they needed to follow up, we were ready for a conversation. So that's one. Two, we also had a lot of people to step up and give. And you know, as UNRWA USA, we're trying to understand our legal obligation now because this is a, a very weird time. Is UNRWA still delivering in Gaza? Yes. They're still working around the clock. My understanding, they had funding till the end of this month. But there is new funding. I think the Irish stepped up and gave a bigger contribution. So I'm not sure how long they can go until the investigation ends. The interim report or the interim results of the investigation will be released end of March. The final results will be released end of April. So we're hopeful that some of that uh, pause will end. That also created confusion where donors come and ask me, hey, is my 
duration now pause? Is it going to get to Gaza? And they tell him, no, it affected only state here. That's one. They will say, can we, uh, is, are you getting aid into Gaza? Yes, UNO was delivering daily for Gaza as much as they allowed. But remember, some aid does not not need a truck. You know, like mental health support. That doesn't need a truck. Healthcare, some medicine, yes, but the visits and all that, the midwives and stuff, that's still happening. There is other programs like uh, sanitation. You know, there is a lot of that uh, fuel uh, for pumping water and things like that. Only one hour is doing a lot of things that normally it wouldn't do. Only one hour is the part, the trusted partner of the U.S. and his wife to deliver fuel to the hospitals and bakeries. They say this garbage, but they also still work with the agency and trust the agency because it has a good accountability system. But it's a very strange time again. So. So that's sort of the work we're doing. I interact with this conflict at more than one level. I've done a lot of media interviews. In fact, the situation with UNRWA, I have MSNBC and a few BBCs waiting for me to say, now I can talk in the media. You know, we're trying, we're trying to be as responsible and not to engage. You know, the PR communication person we talked to, he said, make all these stories become like the one hand clap. You know, if you respond, then it makes sense. So that's sort of the approach that we're headed toward, because you could say something that makes things worse. At the end of the day, none of us that work at the Norway USA want to be the reason children and adults are not to eat food. That's the main thing we think about this. If we become the story, then that's a problem. And it's been hard to do the work while facing allegations and you know we were we're we're hearing from confused donors we're hearing some people they paused their our donation like it's just a very strange time and you know i don't really i don't want to really talk about the political stuff so much but i've been engaged in many conversations and the government official the highest level had a couple of meetings with secretary blinken uh, the national security advisor jake sullivan and you know a lot of great people in the white house meetings and all that we get nowhere you know it used to be the easy thing is like we'll give you some humanitarian aid no ceasefire but we'll give you more aid but even that that's not happening we're not talking about hey get computers into gaza or you know computer chips no potato chips you know something like and we're not getting anywhere and it's 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 difficult you know, you, you meet people in the government and they understand the struggle. They know. There's, they know everything you know and more. It's just the action that feels a little bit behind. And, you know, I'll just leave that for the discussion and the Q&A later. But, uh, you know, it certainly has been harder for us to talk about this issue without uh, talking about this issue. You know, like I happen to be very active on LinkedIn, and now, you know, there are certain things I, I should not say or I couldn't say because I do not <coughs> want to become the story. I, you know, my family is there in the north of Gaza. Nobody's getting aid to them. I've mentioned to folks, I said, I sit here in the White House with some of you guys here, and I cannot send my mom a hundred dollars. I meet with the State Department, and my mom is still stuck in Gaza. She would, they wouldn't help me evacuate. Her. That's how impossible the situation feels. You know, you think you're like meeting with these hot shots in our government, and they are. But when it comes to Gaza, very few people make these decisions. So think about that for a minute. Probably five people. They're the ones who are shaping the whole Gaza situation in the government. My own impression, unrelated to now USA. I, I was I was telling some of your some of the earlier here. I was so desperate for good news from Gaza, so I started a soup kitchen with my brother in the north, and that gives me joy whenever I see the pictures of them providing folks with food. You know, and it's it's. You know, people talk about air drop and all that. I don't know if you saw the videos. Most of these ships, these containers, ended up in the, in the water. Today, the Palestinians have to go fish and rescue what they can. 
I hope they bring in more aid to the north. They're limiting it. The Saudi Israeli government has placed some games. When I'll, I'll get back to the super team. The, for example, the US government tells the Israeli government, hey, bring in more aid to the north. They say, OK. We've given UNRWA five times permits to go deliver food to the north. Thank you so much. But they neglect to say four times out of those five times, they never allowed the mission to go. So these are the conflicted missions that we as UNRWA tells the Israelis, we have 10 containers, we want to deliver flour. Okay, here's a permit. When actually it comes to doing it, the Israelis impede this with different uh, excuses. In fact, three weeks ago, they bombed an UNRWA truck. You cannot do that by accident. You know, they bombed it from a naval ship. Luckily, nobody was hurt. But how many victims? Enough, 30,000? You know, UNRWA lost 158 of the staff. This is the largest crisis of victim number in the, in the UN history. I, you know, other things will be going to the UN to meet with the Secretary General on March 6th. He's already met rightfully, with the Israeli hostages' families a few times already. He has never, as far as we know, and we've been told, he has never met with family, people with family in Gaza. So March 6th would be the first time he would hear directly from the families. So I was invited to this meeting. I made sure we have a, a Palestinian woman in the room. We have a Palestinian Christian voice. Because this is a very important voice, but oftentimes not centered as much. The third oldest church in Palestine was found. And it sits across the street from the oldest mosque in Gaza. And my friend, there's a thousand Palestinians, Christians. There, there, there should be 10,000 Palestinians, 20,000 Palestinian Christians. A lot of them cannot. Even people inside praying inside the church got found. You want to convince me this is about each? Anyway, so this is to say like small things you could do, you know, you could definitely would love to see your support for UNRWA USA. And notice number one is sent aid, second is start the fundraiser, this is what we call the other for Gaza, where people, hey, I don't feel like having a birthday, I want to do something for Gaza or a baby shower. The last one is the call for a ceasefire, because without a humanitarian ceasefire, none of the work is going to get anywhere. And without a fuel, doesn't matter how many trucks you bring in a day because it's not going to go anywhere. <coughs> That's why out of frustration and just that, I called my brother who was detained and paraded and clothed by the IDF. He started a, a soup kitchen. He literally risked his life by going to these farms and digging potatoes and buying whatever thing he can buy at the premium. So they cook up large meals for people and distribute them. That's sort of like the one thing I can change. We've given up on the ceasefire, it seems. Yeah. What can you do from here? A lot of things, you know? I mean, you could advocate, center Palestinian voices, talk about it. Make choices about where you spend your money. You know? Just be conscious about things like that. Lift up the voices. Uh, advocate. I've dedicated two months Every Wednesday, I would go to Capitol Hill and advocate as a Palestinian with members of Congress. It should not be only 62 or 65 of members have called for a ceasefire. It should be like 400 by now. You've seen all the nasty videos from that congressman from that state. I don't want to name anybody. And the other one from that other state where people retire in, saying nasty things about uh, the Palestinian and sometimes children. Honestly, as an American, I, I'm, I was here for Manila, and I've seen those emotions. In my opinion, this feels a lot harder and natural <coughs> today. You know, this is a very challenging time. Every morning I wake up to hate messages in my Facebook and LinkedIn, and really like bullying and chat, like it's just graphic. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is, and my boss tells me I have not taken a day since October 7th, and I keep working. I even miss Thanksgiving and all that stuff. I don't care. And I'm losing vacation time, fine, but I really want to be responsive. 
and what breaks my soul is when a rumor like this comes out, and I have the attitude of always respond to donors, even with the right. Just I want to acknowledge the communication. I can no longer do that because everybody's asking these questions 24 hours. And I can tell you, if they don't hear from us, they're going to suspend this gift. And I remind these folks, you might be angry with me, but I fear that the people who will suffer this is the children or the folks who are really risking their life to deliver water to those places. I'd love to answer some questions. I, you know, I'm sorry I don't have any good news, but uh, you know, I just want to tell you, get inspired. You know, my brother got beaten up, humiliated, detained, and he's still helping the people as much as he can. We help him financially to buy these things. And one, one funny thing he told me when he was arrested and blindfolded and stuff. They said they took the blindfold to take a picture so they identify if he's a person of interest or not. And he said, some of these officers were giving me the middle finger the American way, not the way we do it. So this is to tell you, like, you know, like, I was like, wow, that's just, you know, he noticed that. He said, they do this. And he said, they call me SOB in Arabic and Hebrew and English, everything. And physically, physically, he wasn't, he said, he wasn't physically abused or assaulted, but he said they were kept naked in the sand for 20 hours, blindfolded, not knowing if they got it. He said they've taken his boy with him, who's 30, they detained his boy with him, who's 13 years old. And he said, when somebody said this guy doesn't have an ID, which makes him a minor, they let him go. My brother said, I feel so much joy because, because I knew my bloodline is safe now. My boy Omar has been released. He, he, and that was early on. He thought he's not coming back from this trip. And he said when they released him, no shoes, they let him in the middle of nowhere. They had to walk about three miles with their boxers and tied behind the back. No shoes, remember, this is what, broken road, drop in charge, all that stuff. And a week later, when they went to Kamal at one hospital, remember Hani, I told you his story? The guy who got shot in the head? The Israeli soldiers beat him up with their boots, calling him H. Because, you know, he's injured, he must be, and he's a little boy. Can you imagine in front of his, my brother, in front of his, his son is being beaten by people who have no business being there, and calling him names, and my brother feels so helpless. And, you know, they beat his son there. And he's a minor, really. I would say try to write it sometimes. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> all right. Oh, please, yeah. I, I can speak loudly, if that's all right. Yeah, we can. Uh, okay. If yeah. I can make a quick comment. Um, sure. This is an election year, presidential election year in the United States. March 5th is the primary. I voted today, I voted in the Democratic primary, and I voted uncommitted expressly, although I've been a Biden supporter for some time, but I will not. That's my comment. Um, my question is, this morning, uh, I heard that Samantha Power, the administrator for um, uh, USAID, announced that support to UNRWA for Gaza was being curtailed and support for food support to Gaza was going to be di diverted to WFP. What are the implications of that? What are the implications for what you do? What are the implications for Gaza? Thank you. I'll tell you, man, if you turn on that camera. <laughs> Please go ahead. Thank you for your work, condolences on your losses, and please know that there are many people in Maine who share your grief, and I will add rage. Um, it's interesting that the accusations against UNRWA came out the very day after the International Court of Justice ruling. I have 100 questions, but I'll limit it to one. After all of this suffering, and this is a very speculative question, do you think, and in what time frame something good will come for the Palestinian people? 
But before answering uh, my question, I would just like to, to uh, add something. Um, I'm involved with a group called Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights, which is part of a broader coalition called the Maine Coalition for Palestine. And we're working on these issues day and night. If anyone wants to join our mailing list, you can see me, I have a clipboard, or go on to a website, Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights, when, where you can sign on. We have action alerts, topical pieces, because we want to be part of something that makes a change. Thank you. So join this group. Thank you for your solidarity. My boss at Illinois USA happens to be a Jewish American. She is the one who is telling me, go speak. She's centering, she's taking the DEI lesson seriously. When this country has forgotten about this, my boss, there is no interview I could ask. She told me, go. Do it, speak your truth, talk to your family. And that's very liberating to know that this is not about any religion. In addition to that, my wife and I went to a march, and I, I'm going to have to admit my ignorance. We went to the Jewish Voice for Peace march in D.C. that ended up to be the largest Jewish gathering ever in history for Palestine. That was, I had no idea this is happening. And I went there, and I thought, okay, I'll march with a bunch of people who are conflicted Zionists. Oh, we're sorry for you, Palestinians, but there's a, you know. I was surprised how hardcore and how committed these folks are. To, like they were chanting things, I may go to jail if I chant. And they, they, they went to the Senate, and my wife was there standing in the front line holding the banner. I'm just saying, this is great. This is like, a, we felt we feel the love and the support, and it didn't matter, it had a limit, and it was the largest Jewish rally for God. So, where do you start? You know, like, uh, as far as my analysis of what's happening, basically I think the Israelis want to slow down and pause the military campaign in Ramadan. Because in Ramadan it would be harder for them to manage things in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Muslims will, will riot in Jakarta. And, you know, so they want to just give themselves a break and avoid inflaming the situation. So that's my read of what's going to happen. And then after that, they're going to go into Rafah. So they've been, they really want to deal right now, free some of their hostages, and you know, maybe. And you see, this is how vile this is. They're saying they cannot get aid into Gaza now while they're negotiating for letting 500 trucks in. So remember, they could do it, but the will is not there. So anything long term, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to see any anything. I put together a proposal as a civilian Palestinian American and you know there's some ideas we're working with I'd love to send it your way you know but it's not they destroyed life every single freaking university in Gaza is destroyed the 32 hospitals they're they're I don't know they're like a horror show right now UNRWA has 22 healthy clinics only like four of them are operational in other words, the, the Palestine vaccination rate is 99%, which is higher than Germany because of UNRWA's work. You want to tell me you want to take an organization like that? UNRWA has 7 million patient visits a year. 7 million. If it was in the US, UNRWA would be the largest, the third largest education system in America after, take a guess, <clears throat> New York and Los Angeles. You think World Food Program runs the schools? They do, they do work already with don't know what they deliver food. They, they have presence in Gaza, but nowhere near the capacity to do that. Nobody, no UN agency is saying they want to replace UNRWA or are interested in replacing UNRWA. So, you know, there are some people who have their own plans. The reality will, uh, will talk some common sense to them. I hope that gives you some ideas. I'd like some more questions and follow-ups. Don't speak at once, you know, take your time.
But now I'm feeling very nervous and not very confident, so um, I'm just going to ask a question. Um, I was wondering um, how can people join Irma so that they can be on the ground, like in Palestine? Um, are there any avenues and like what kind of skills should um, one who is interested in this uh, go to study for? I really just don't have any guidance. Hey, thank you. So, go ahead. No, thank you. Appreciate it. So, as you know, I have a Gaza IV, and I cannot even get to Gaza right now. They wouldn't let me back to meet with my family. The only people that are not from Gaza that have been allowed in are medical doctors, nurses, and they come in teams. Two organizations, one organization I love called PAMA, Palestinian American Medical Association. They've sent uh, medical teams to Gaza. In fact, they have one now. There are American doctors in Kansas and Ohio, and you know, and they're, they, they, they choose to go to support the people and just really be help people. So that's one. I, the UN system, all these UN staff, sometimes they send World Food programs and staff, UNICEF. They have not allowed journalists, to the best of my knowledge, to go into Gaza, and it's very restrictive. Now, leaving Gaza, you've heard about uh, things Palestinians have to do to leave Gaza and the fees they have to, it's calling fees, okay, I'm being nice tonight. The fees they charge the Palestinians of $5,000 to leave for, to save their lives. I call it a ransom, actually, it's not. So, I'm, I'm sure, like, I'm sorry, we don't have, like, UNRWA is not the only staff that go, is the medical staff, the operation staff, but as far as yeah, civilians and folks, even like me, owner wouldn't be able to get me in, even though I have a gas ID. It's basically a closed crime scene right now. So they're not getting in and out. And eventually, they will have to let in some people and activists to come and do some work. But right now, this is not happening. Everything we know about Gaza is not the same anymore. The last time I looked, so don't hold me to the 70% of the homes in the north where my family is are destroyed. In my case, it's 100%. My family's home where we grew up, my brother's home that he was killed in, my own apartment in Tel Aviv. First, they blew up the staircase. Look how genius this is. They go into the building, if they haven't destroyed it, they blew up the staircase. So this is useless anymore and nobody can go up. So my apartment is on the fourth floor. They blew up the staircase, so we cannot get to it. So that's the sort of damage we're talking about. I'm hoping to go to Gaza this summer, practically after Ramadan, to help and be with my family. But sometimes I think, you know, if you believe in God, there is always a plan. And, you know, I reflect back on the reason why I came to the U.S. 24 years ago. Everybody's still in Gaza. I don't know. It's, uh, it's a lot. You know, or it's, I'm not the same in my marriage because of what's going on in Gaza. You know, you're not, you're not you. You know, the kids hear us talk about it. We try to shoot them. But it's, it's, it's a lot. And you know we're humans, and you know we. I, I, I do think I have a calling to do this work, and I do it with other way USA. I do it with other folks. I try to amplify as many voices as I can. But you know this will take all of us. So if you share the message, if you feel comfortable talking about this, please do. It does matter, and hopefully, for folks like you who vote, please do vote. Never not vote. You know that's that's how you show your strength. And, I think there's an opportunity for Arab and American Muslims to show an allies to show their strength. If we if we just do nothing, if we change nothing, then we will get nothing. We've seen all the limit of humanitarian aid. More and more Arab Americans and American and American Muslims are starting PACs, political action committees, because they want to organize. They're all heartbroken. They're like, wow, I thought I'm a big deal. The governor is speed died and the government hasn't called for a ceasefire. You know, so that's where we're, the situation we're dealing with. And if pitch in any time, come on. Yeah, yeah one more question. Uh, one, I'm just confused about uh, what crossings 
you're tr they're trying to get humanitarian aid in. Is it through all through Rafa, or is it you know there's that other one? Con, yeah. I, don't, I forget. Yeah. So. Carrots, or, no. So first they open only Rafa. Yeah. Rafa Egyptians fully control it, but the Egyptians and the Israelis agreed that do not let anything until the Israelis is checked. Technically, the Israelis don't have any presence in Rafah, so they've been rerouting the trucks 100 kilometers to this Israeli checkpoint in Raoja. They check it and bring it back to Rafah. Why this is a problem? So you have a truck, there is one item the Israelis don't like. The truck has to go back to the line 300 trucks ago. So that makes it slower. You never know what the Israelis don't like, they never share it with you. So UNRWA has a warehouse that has reject items like tents because it has a metal rain or something like that. So, so that's Rafah is the main one, but it's really not meant for goods. It's meant for passengers. Mm -hmm. I traveled from Rafah. Now, the one they opened about two months ago was Karim Salom, Karim Shalom. That's the one where they have the capacity to bring in more goods, and that's the one traditionally they've used. As I mentioned, the Israeli right wings have marched their people to block that. And uh, Israelis pretend not to be able to do anything about it. So this way, they could say, we have the aid, but we can't get it in. So that's one. Aries could work. The Israelis promised at some point that they will bring in flour to the north from Aries crossing, because Eshdod, the port next to Gaza, very close, you could see it from Gaza, is they have, uh, I think, 1,200, 12,000 tons of flour. It's waiting there, but as far as I know, it has not reached north, but that's one item that Bibi Netanyahu promised he would, but it hasn't happened. So, as of right now, Rafa and Karim There might be other options, I don't know. Airdropping is good, but it hasn't really, like you, I've seen videos of it going into the water. And in fact, one of them ended up at the Israeli shore. And they're like, they thought it's a bomb or something. I was like, really? Like, they have enough goods there. We need it here. All right, one last question. Then. All right. Go on once. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.